Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is Bishop Sue Hoppert Johnson, and we are continuing our series called Strength for Today and Bright Hope for Tomorrow, God's Vision for the Next Chapter of the United Methodist Church. And the conversations continue. This is one, gonna be one of my favorite conversations, I have no doubt. Uh, two delightful folks who I have worked with and known for a while are Jan Lawrence, who is the director of the Reconciling Ministries Network, also known as RMN, and Helen Ride, who is the Southeastern Jurisdiction and half of the Northeastern Jurisdiction organizer for RMN. And, you know, I, I think that as we talk about the next chapter of the United Methodist Church, it's helpful to uh, weigh in with these wise women what their greatest hopes for the church are and what we've learned uh, from the kind of the rocky road, no, the extremely rock, not even kind of, the extremely rocky road we've traveled over the past few years. And I think where I want to begin is just to dispel the notion that you guys are a militant force for gay power and you want to usurp everything in the church to your ends. And, and I think I would love to, I mean, one thing I've long appreciated is how RMN, when they talk about churches, when they become reconciling churches, what a what a soft touch they do with that and how careful they are. So I'd love to hear kind of how how churches become reconciling churches and how that compares to kind of the the uh, takeover of churches we've seen in the past couple of years. I take that one, Jen. Yeah, I was gonna say you should take that one. Okay. <laughs> Well, I think one of the important things to uh, for folks to understand is that the foundational um, value of the reconciling process, so when we're engaged in dialogue with churches about them potentially becoming reconciling, a discernment process um, where the outcome is not known, mm -hmm. um, the foundational value we use is this term relational organizing. Mm -hmm. And the reason that piece is so very important is that we're aware that we are these conversations are always very tender conversations and they're always taking place in the context of a group of people who have lived together sometimes for generations, like generations of families of individuals who have, who have been in church in various ways together and they're engaging on this discernment process, which almost always at the beginning is not something everyone is on the same page about. That's pretty sure. normal. Sure. There's normally when the process starts, there is normally, you know, a, a significant portion of the congregation who are desiring to move in that direction. So it's, it rarely comes from nowhere. Right. This is something that's been kind of builder, building and being nurtured over time is this sense of this desire to move to a more clearly articulated, inclusive position around LGBTQ folks. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes I'm invited in for a conversation. Um, what we do is we encourage the, the congregation to form a group of uh, mainly lay people. This is really a lay led conversation. And often I'm invited to be part of their some of their organizing meetings. And one of the things I emphasize always is this process takes as long as it takes. And it is not a race. There is no deadline to meet. Um, and the reason for that is, is because we really honor the context in which this conversation is happening. We honor the relationships that are already um, at work and at play within their congregation. And those things really um, are, are super important. And um, the other important thing to know is that we require a 75% vote to affiliate with RMN. So this is more than any of the votes that have been a higher requirement than any of the um, votes that um, have been taking place in the denomination recently. And again, the reason is because when a church votes to become a reconciling church, what they're saying is, this is who we are. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to make that statement, this is who we are, it needs to represent by far the super majority of the people who are participating mm -hmm. in that church. So do you and push it to a church. vote? Do you push it to a vote? Yeah, so we all, the, a vote is needed. Mm -hmm. But the vote is never a final vote mm -hmm. until it's known where the de destination is. So one of the other things we really encourage is what's called a straw poll vote. Mm -hmm. And that would be if we were to vote today uh, to become a reconciling church, you know, would you vote yes or no? And if you would vote no, 
what are some additional questions you might have? So it's continually opening the door for people to say, you know what, we've talked about this, but you never really answered my question here, or I have concerns about this. And so it's, again, constantly the, 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 the intention is to uh, prioritize the relationship, prioritize dialogue, prioritize conversation in a meaningful way, not in a way that uh, pushes a determined, predetermined outcome but in a way that is genuinely honest and open and, and inviting that dialogue and that conversation and more education and so on. Right. I have one church, I tell a story quite often in New York, um, which took nine years to become a reconciling church because every time they took a straw poll vote, somebody had a question that was a legitimate question. They said, you know what, we're not ready. Mm -hmm. And they, they wanted to bring as many people along as possible. And so they continued to delay the final vote because every time they had a straw poll and they had a legitimate question, even if they could have passed the vote, there was still a legitimate question. Mm -hmm. They wanted to bring along as many people as possible. So the, the key here is that it's relational. It's, it's about building up the body. It's not about tearing the body apart. It's about including everyone in the process all the way through, being super intentional about who's not participating in the conversation, inviting them in. Um, you know, I wonder what the outcomes would have been if that had been the approach in some of the situations that we've had recently um, with disaffiliation votes and conversations. I haven't seen that kind of approach right. I haven't much either. anywhere, to be honest with you. Well, and, you know, I think you would agree based on context, your goal wasn't ever that every church would be reconciled. Nope. You know, there are just some that never will be, or it might take a long time and yep. you can live with that, right? So yeah. I, I just look at the wreckage and I look at the relationships that have been ripped apart. Friends who've been longtime friends who aren't speaking anymore. Generations, a lot of children and parents ripped apart. Um, the public witness of the church through all of this. I just, it's heartbreaking. So how, how do we envision a different future for the United Methodist Church? And what's our ideal for the church as we move forward? Let's see if I can, in five words or less, answer. <laughs> <laughs> if you can do that, you need to write a book of five words. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think the the future of the United Methodist Church is very hopeful, mm -hmm. right? I, so there's a lot of things that will happen um, as this season that we're in now comes to a close that will change the way we are, we all relate to each other. Um, it will change, we hope, the some of the vitriol that we see at some of the have seen at some of the past general conferences. Um, so and and I my way of kind of describing it is the people that will still be at the table want to be in the United Methodist Church. Right. Right. So those no matter how progressive or conservative somebody is, they're in the they're still there but in part of the conversation because that's the church that they love yeah. and that's the church they want to be a part of. So I think that, I think that alone is hope filled. Um, I think when you look at the potential of what could happen at the upcoming general conference and general conference and general conference, um, meaning the three between now and 2028, <laughs> you know, I think yeah. that that's all positive, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a it's a very interesting time. It's hard to imagine three general conferences, even if one of them is a call session in in um, five years. But but I think that it you know it's mm -hmm. it's what we need now, right? Um, and it I envision a very hopeful future. And I think the work that's happening across the church that includes people from all perspectives in the conversation. And I mean, work that's happening outside the official church kind of structure, but just some of the the connections and collaborations between people and groups and caucuses um, that have a have a connection to the United Methodist Church is right. the best that I've ever seen. Right. Right. We will walk into general conference as a United Methodist Church that has some, I think, some values that we all want to figure out how to live into. Yeah. Um, and everybody will be looking forward to the day that we can actually take steps in that direction. And, you know, then, I mean, my goal, my my personal, I guess, goal is the wrong word, but what I would hope that we see 
is that by the time we get to 2028, general conferences become missional in nature. Oh, me too. <laughs> I mean, that, no, no, that to me is the legislature. <laughs> no, you know, we're missional. Yeah. Let, let legislative stuff happen in, in, in the region. So. Well, one thing we experienced in Virginia this year is we really did have holy conferencing because we focused on mission and relationship, right? That that um, that what we define as the business of conferencing is not business, right? That what we what's more important is that we share our experience of Christ in our region. The best general conference I can ever think of, the best part of a general conference. Something happened and we couldn't do business one day in our legislative committee. So we just sat around and talked about where we saw Christ in our different areas. And I still treasure those were those were two hours of of sacred time to hear how God is at work in every continent and in so many different places in so many different ways. That's life giving. That's not sitting around and, you know, uh, well, why would we want to model after Congress, right? There's a functional body that clearly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> let's, but, let's go back to that. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I and I think of um in the in the in February I was at a let me get this right uh stand central a standing committee on Central Conference Affairs Matters standing committee yeah. on Central Conference Matters meeting in Germany. And I was sitting around the table with a German bishop, a Norwegian professor, a Swiss layperson, um, a couple of others, and a DS from Sierra Leone. And we met together the whole time and developed, I think, a high level of trust and community in our group. And toward the end, one of the DSs from the DS from Sierra Leone said, I need you guys to help me. And I said, oh, you know, we were all, okay, whatever. And he said, um, I am a Bible scholar. I have read scripture and I do not understand how we can include LGBTQ. Um, what am I missing? And I thought about it and I said, I think what you're missing is relationship. You're missing deep life together with LGBTQ folks because I think anybody, it's it certainly, I didn't, I didn't come out of seminary um, with it, I grew up in Lakeland, Florida, right? So conservative. And everything I'd ever heard about a gay person growing up was not only negative, but um, uh, insulting and abusive, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the life experience in the in the acculturation I carried in the ministry. And I entered into ministry in in the AIDS crisis. And was working in hospitals, watching men say goodbye to each other tenderly. And then having key, amazing, amazing lay people in my churches who would, um, after I got to know them, reveal that they were, um, that they were gay and that, you know, they had a significant relationship. And God did a number on me, you know, how you can't be in relationship and see the Holy Spirit so powerfully in the relationships and in the commitment of folks. And so when I look at the world <laughs> and the parts of the United States where relationships are not condoned or welcomed or celebrated, where there's not deep relationship in the churches among uh, folks, you know, the average person off the street and the gay members of the church, I don't think you ever get it. But once you see the Holy Spirit at work, I don't think you can deny it. So. What are your thoughts on that? And how do we how do we have meaningful relationships? Because I I, I uh, became an advocate for uh, inclusion because I have folks who have spoken into my life, who have loved me as Christ loves me, and I have only seen Christ in their lives. So how do we give people that kind of exposure? So I think that. Then this is a short answer to that, but I but I think it is in conversation. It is in the relationships mm -hmm. we've been talking about, and I'll share an experience that I had recently um, with a Bible study group. Um, and some of the it, it was a United Methodist Church, and these were mostly um, mostly women in the room, and nobody wanted to be. Everybody was kind. <laughs> well, that's good. I'll 
Kind is good. Yeah. <laughs> and and so the the woman that was speaking was wording things very carefully, but but you know, she finally looked at me and she said, you know, she said, I think the problem we have here is we've never had any real conversation. Right? We've we had um we painted rainbow signs and put them in the front yard of the church, but that was a decision of a couple of people. Right. Um, and the rest of the congregation didn't know anything about it and didn't what didn't participate. And then we've never had any conversation since then. We did Wednesday night suppers and they, you know, they talked about United Methodist history and that history ended at like 2016. Hmm. We didn't talk about anything that's happened since then. And we certainly didn't talk about the moment we're in now. And so I think that's a lot. And, and I can tell you in that congregation, it was fear driven, right? The the minister right. didn't want to go into the, didn't want to wade into that. And I can appreciate that. Mm -hmm. But but you have that happening in spades across the church. So you're missing the opportunity to build relationships with people who don't think like you. Mm -hmm. Because the conversation that's happening is happening in the small groups in the hallway outside where the people that are in the conversation all think alike. Yeah. Um, and so I think we just have to push that. I mean, I've, I've gone back with that church now has a different minister and I've gone back and said, OK, we have got to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. We've had a pride service the last two years before we have a third pride service in the education building here. We have got to have a conversation in the congregation. You just mm -hmm. can't keep doing this. Right. Um, so and I just think that I to me, that's what's missing in a lot of cases. And I know that that's kind of. Uh, looking for rose colored glasses, because I know those conversations are not easy and you have to have willing participants. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. You can get into yeah, you, can't you have to know when to take yourself out of that when it, when a congregation right. is not going to have right. a conversation that's, that's right. positive. Um, but I really believe that relationship building is the answer to the question you ask. It's mm -hmm. all in that. One yeah. Helen, thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the thing one thing I would mention is um, for LGBTQ people, for queer, for queer folks to enter in, into those conversations, you have to be ready and not everyone's ready or wants to. And so right. I would, for those that are listening, I would really want to, um, I would really want to encourage allies to be the ones who are the relationship builders. Mm -hmm. um, because there's uh, the story of allies' stories, and you've just described your story of how you Mm -hmm. became an ally right right ally stories make a difference and they can pave the way for for people to be ready to be in dialogue with lgbtq folks in a healthier way than they may otherwise have done right right so i think you know for some of us like myself and jan and others you know <laughs> this is what we do so i have conversations <laughs> with people right, I put right myself in spaces and places uh intentionally to be in conversation with people continuing to do that um and and that's good, but that's not for everybody, and neither sh yeah. neither should it necessarily be for everyone. Right. I guess is what I'm saying. But yeah. I do believe strongly that allies are the, are a pathway towards that happening, and can and also have really essential um, essential stories of their own journeys that can make a strong difference and impact on people. Right. Um, and I, but but having said that. I'm always going to say relationship matters and conversations matter. No question. Every time I, mm -hmm. at 2016 general conference, um, I used my pretty crummy French to try and I sat down with a few delegates from central conference delegates from Africa and try and try to tell them my story. And let me just tell you, when I was in England speaking French more regularly, I was not really an out queer person. So I didn't have many of the words even that not I needed funny. to no, use. Okay, <laughs> But I managed to get to the point where they understood who I was. At that point, they invited me to come to their country so they could find me a husband. So clearly they weren't completely getting it. <laughs> and they they said, they said, you know, if you came to our country, essentially as, a, as an LGBTQ person, again, I'm putting language in their mouths, but this is the essence of the conversation. Right. Then people would pick up stones and throw them at you. Mm. And I was like, well, what would you do? And they said, we would try to stop them. Good. And I was like, well, that's that's good, right? That's, I mean, this is that's a very- That's clearly biblical. <laughs> but that's a good- Right. That's like, that's a different approach. There are people right. in their country who would do this, but they would do that, the other. They would stop that happening. They could see that that is something that's wrong. Well- And so 
I feel like one of my hopes for the future United Methodist Church is we figure out what our global connection looks like and that we do it in a way that's more appropriate, but that we stay in relationship because I want those folks who knew in, intuitively that stopping people throwing stones was the right thing to do. Right. Might be ready at some point for the next conversation about why do they think that's the right thing to do? And yeah. what might be another piece of knowledge, another piece of understanding that could be added to that that mm -hmm. might eventually come to the place where they weren't trying to find me a husband, you know, right. and they were actually right. willing to accept who I was and my partner and so on. So I think um, I think the iterative process uh, that folks will make the case, and it's a good case, that justice delayed is justice denied. There's no question that is true. So having to endure um, a situation where LGBTQ people are not treated the way they ought to be treated is justice denied and that's not okay absolutely um, and we're waiting on it but we don't wait passively we wait actively right right and so and i think i think everything in terms of the relationship building is this is what we can do now to ensure a better future and mm -hmm. I, I my main thing is it's not going to just automatically happen because we take a vote at general conference no if we take a vote and we change a rule nothing we might some folks might feel a little bit more liberated right to have conversations and go in certain directions but nothing actually changes so this we need a long-term view of this work that this is ongoing relational organizing engaging people in dialogue and conversation and bringing them to the place where they can squarely say i'm a christian and i affirm lgbtq people and there's nothing in those two sentences that contradict one another right Right. Well, and I, you know, I always say, gosh, 1964, what a great year when we passed, the United States passed the Civil Rights Act and all racism ended, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, that is, legislation's one thing, but, but the human heart and, and this is what I don't get, folks. This is what I don't get. And, you know, as a, as a advocate, as an ally for LGBTQ folks. The stuff that has been said about me, the stuff that has been written to me, the ugly, I mean, the pure, the pure, just undistilled ugliness. And if I'm just an ally, I can't even imagine what you've gone through. And, you know, I have family members. Alan has two cousins, my niece, Anna. It just breaks my heart. So on behalf of the church, if we, I don't think we have to theologically agree to be loving to one another. And that's what I think is the biggest disgrace of this whole time in the church, that, mm -hmm. that there are something, I mean, if the fruits of the spirit, and I'll just get back on my soapbox, because this is my constant refrain. If the fruits of this Holy Spirit, if Jesus is working in you, it's manifested in love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, faithfulness, generosity, and self-control, how am I not acting in that way to every human being, regardless how they believe? And that, to me, is the biggest... Um, I, I, some days I, I have questions about the existential purpose of the church, right? And who are, <laughs> who are we creating? Well, who are we creating? I mean, if, 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 you know, as Martin Luther said, if we're the whole goal of human life is to become little Christ, the United Methodist church is failing miserably. And I just don't see how you can have, be angry and have, you know, your arteries throbbing in your neck and be hurling insults and yelling and just be so ugly and call yourself a follower of Christ. And that is my biggest concern. But no matter what, how, you know, who you view to be a sinner, no matter how you perceive somebody, this behavior is just not acceptable in any realm. So I, I, you know, on behalf of the church, I'm appalled. It's appalling. You're right. <laughs> but it's getting better. And I, yeah. I just want to say, as on a note of hope, I just, you know, we've seen it in pretty much every single annual conference is since these disaffiliations happened, new new things springing up. Right, in places right. Nothing. And I, I won't name the place, partly because 
I don't want to add undue pressure in that situation. But there is a an, a geographic area in one of our conferences in the Southeast jurisdiction where if I named it, you would all immediately go to extreme fundamentalist conservative Christianity, you know, that with, with little hope. And, and it's an area where if we had worked for 20 years, we would never have had a reconciling church in that area, highly unlikely. Well, all, wow. all the churches disaffiliated, every single one. Yeah. But there's a remnant from those churches that have started a new church. Mm -hmm. And that church is not yet reconciling, but it is already demonstrating a way of being in their community that is radically different from anything any of those churches that left were right. was doing. Right. Radically different. Right. And and so for me, I'm like, we would never have had, and I don't know this for a fact, but I'm I'm pretty certain there is not much other inclusive affirming faith tradition in that area. So yeah. I, I believe the United Methodist Church is many churches were held back from wanting to pursue a more inclusive stance. Mm -hmm. And I believe this season of disaffiliation, as painful as it has been, has liberated folks to be able to pursue a ministry in a way they really long wanted to pursue it. And right. so I, I see our influence, I pray, I think there's strong potential that our, our influence in terms of transforming the world um, I would say, especially in parts of the Southeast and South Central jurisdiction in the United States, has exponentially increased mm -hmm. yes. because of what we've been through, because right. the places and the groups and the individuals and the ministers and the lay people and the clergy that remain, um, even if they're not quite ready to be reconciling or quite ready to put a rainbow flag out there, have a have a different orientation to their to what how they want to be church in their communities. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly those kinds of communities that we need, are desperately right. needed. Right. We only have to look at the politics of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, they're desperately needed in our communities. So I'm I'm super, I'm really hopeful, actually. Good, <laughs> that's yeah. some really good new works emerging and, and transformative work that's going to make a, a significant impact in our communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think the other thing that I would add to what Helen just said, so I'd affirm everything that they just said, but but the other thing that I would add um, is just, I have gotten three or four phone calls from folks, mostly in the South, because most of these kinds of things are happening. That's where, where concentrated groups of mm -hmm. people are leaving. Um, but I have had multiple people call and say things like, um, we want to start a church that looks different from what most United Methodist churches look like today because we think that's what's needed to attract some population, not always LGBTQ, but some population in the in the area. But we want to do it as a part of the United Methodist Church. So, you know, how do we do that and how do we get started in that? And so that and these are kind of, these are, you know, sometimes young ministers that that aren't real plugged into to church planning kinds of things that are happening in the denomination, but just the enthusiasm. I had a, a a conversation that lasted a couple of hours a few days ago with someone who said, I just want a storefront, right? I want a storefront. I want to rent it. I want to furnish it with comfortable couches. And I want to hang a sign out on Sunday morning that says, come in for coffee and, and Jesus. Yeah. Right? That um, easy. Yeah. So, you know, that's, Th those kinds of things kind of get me excited. I mean, it's it's right. different from what I grew up as thinking church was. So I will admit that my I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church and became a United Methodist because when I went back to church after a couple of decade hiatus from organized religion, as, as we used to say in those days, um, we um, loved God but but didn't love religion. Um, so you know, when I went back, I visited a lot a lot of denominations and and I went to a United Methodist Church because it looked the most like the church that I came, came out of and I didn't even realize at the time that was why I had chosen the United Methodist Church and then I got in and I thought okay these are all the reasons that I that I left right but the right. one thing that the United Methodist Church had that it still has that has kept me here for 20 something years now is its outreach in communities is amazing I have not lived anywhere in the last, well, since I've been an adult, where there hasn't been a 
ministerial presence of the United Methodist Church that made a big impression on whatever that local community was. Mm -hmm. um, most of those churches I never went into, but you knew that they were United Methodist. Right. Um, so, you know, so I think there's, there, we have, we have great bones. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I think the hope of the future and the, you know, the changing just kind of how we relate to each other a little bit. And I think it's all good. Yeah. It's hard. Wanna, it's hard. It is hard. You know, the other thing that, that I want to make sure that we say here, because um, we get this question a lot um, is, so what happens if we remove the language in 2024? Mm -hmm. What happens to RMN? Um, my answer to that question is always, well, that's when our work really starts. Yeah. Because that's when we have to work with people in local congregations about how to be in ministry with and to LGBTQ people that never considered it before because right. for whatever reason, they don't think they have any gay people in their church, Yeah, yeah. which I hear a lot too. Well, that was one thing, you know, I can say serving in North Georgia, the most conservative churches would be appalled at how many emails I got from people who said, we have lived in the shadows of this church. We have been key leaders. We have been big donors. We have followed Jesus as best as we could, but our churches do not know who we really are. And that, you know, I, it, that's hard. That's hard. Mm -hmm. But I will say this. I keep hearing all over. <laughs> Boy, this is, and this is, you know, this is always used, I think, um, to instill fear. But, um, man, we do this and we're going to have people married to 20 folks. Or we're going to have bestiality. Or, you know, where does it end? Where does it end? We will have a sexual ethic still in the United Methodist Church, will we not? Absolutely. We and what's have. your sense of what that sexual ethic should be? Oh, I'm not the right person. <laughs> <laughs> That's a trick question, well, isn't it? Yeah, it yeah. is. I, I, so I, I'm I'm interested in sexual ethics for straight people first. Let's get you all sort Oh, of gosh. That, you know that. Yeah. Um, and then we can figure out the rest of us because honestly... Uh, that's when 95% of the mess happens. So let's do that first. Right. <laughs> and, right. and then we can figure out everything else. Well, I think, though, so. I mean, you know, we're all married. I think that we value marriage, right? Mm -hmm. Value, we value um, to love one another. I mean, I'm kind of, I don't, my sexual ethic is pick one person, not your mother, your father, your children, your sisters or brothers, okay? Pick one person and uh, who else is, should we leave out? That's good. Who's not married, right? And pick them and come to a church. And if you're willing to stand in front of the altar of God and say before God and the church, I pledge to love this person as Christ loves the church. That's a good ethic. I can live with that ethic, right? That, that's, that I think is... Um, the level of trust and love and cherishing and that kind of relationship I'm good with. So that's kind of my sexual ethic that, um, and, and a, a deep, a deep respect, a deep cherishing. And quite frankly, um, I have not seen that in most heterosexual relationships. And one of my frustrations that I always say is this is a darn weird place to start being, you know, staunch advocates of marriage because nothing I see, I don't see many churches ever talk about marriage. Um, they only talk against gay marriage. And mm -hmm. clearly the divorce rate in churches is the same as it is in the general public. So why aren't we doing more to, to cultivate and nourish marriages? Mm -hmm. That's, I, that's always my question for churches. Y'all seem to think a whole lot of marriage, but you don't really want to practice it. The, wanting to point the finger at somebody else, right? Let's talk about somebody else so we don't have to talk about me. Right. Um, and I think there's a lot of that. And I think there's, a, I think there's a lot of fear and, and, you know, it, it, probably a lot of people won't, I won't agree with this statement, but I'll go ahead and, and make it. I, you know, I think one of the problems, if you will, when you start talking about sexual ethics in the church and when you start talking about LGBTQ people is we've just come up with this this acronym that's now long, right? Right. Um, and we 
none of us can adequately define and describe what 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 it means right yeah, yeah. In, in terms that that are going to be understood by the by a general audience and i think a lot of times we do disservice to others to well to some people that are on i call it a sexual and, and gender minority kind of spectrum somewhere by lumping them all together mm -hmm. because yeah. the attention is on gay men and lesbians most of the time right and you know and not so much on everything else so people kind of get gay men and lesbians but they really are not educated on any of the other parts right. of the acronym if you will yeah um yeah. and i think that you know that so education is key before we have any conversation about anything right um, and i think that you know we haven't done a good job educating ourselves in the movement Mm -hmm. um, I know from my conversations with pastors that most of them don't feel equipped to handle conversations with congregate congregants. Right. So right. I think there's a there is an educational step there that that has to happen so that we can even talk about what it means. Right. Right. No, agree. And I think that um, where it begins is I um, I respect you as a child of God enough to handle you with care and to want to listen to you. And that's where the church starts. I think, I think if I had to say where the future of the, and, and, you know, all through the Bible, Jesus is dragging these poor disciples to talk to people who nobody else would talk to, mm -hmm. who had, he'd, they'd been written off, right? Let's go talk to a bleeding woman. <laughs> no, Let's go talk to a Roman centurion. Let's go talk to lepers. Let's, so, the gospel is rife with do not prejudge, do not cut off, do not diminish any creature in the image of God. And I, that that's a good place for the church to start as well. So I would I would um would long for a church where I don't know, Parker Palmer says, and I think I probably said this in another uh, webinar is approach the other with wonder. Mm -hmm. I wonder where you came from. I wonder what happened to you. I wonder. I wonder about how you view the world, and I wonder about. And, and that, that's not just with sexuality. That's with everything, right? That's the heart of racial division. It's the heart of. So, how can the church um, truly love God's children as God does? And Maybe that's where we start. I think that's a, a great place, place to start. start. That's <laughs> a great place to start. Yeah. Um, and I think when the, some days I think I'd rather be a sociologist than a bishop because I'd like to study all this and write about it and not have to live it, right? And, have, and be invested in it. I'd love to be like in an ivory tower saying, boy, that's fascinating. I don't quite get it. <laughs> but I think when all is, when the history is written, it, the question will be why what was what was everybody so afraid of right and so i'll just use these last few minutes and y'all can chime in uh we don't want every church oh every church will not be sent a gay pastor right that is not the bishop's goal to make sure I, our goal is not to um persecute conservative churches by sending them gay pastors our goal is not to um, uh, single out and continue to um, lift up conservative people as bigots or wrongheaded. That I haven't ever done that, and I think that's that's not of Christ either. And our goal is to um, to truly have a church where I can disagree with you. But it's the Holy Spirit that binds us together. It's the love of Christ. And that is a greater witness to the world than our agreement. That our relationship together is a better witness to Christ than our agreement on every and, front. And I think that looks a lot like the local church. Right? Yeah. If you really look at the local church, even if you look at reconciling churches, it, to say that everyone in reconciling churches or to say that there are no conservatives in reconciling churches is is just wrong. Right. I mean, yeah. it, they're all over the place. Right. And we welcome them. 
and we have conversation and we're in relationships with them all the time. Right. And I think that that is, you know, sometimes that's a misnomer when people start talking about being a reconciling church. I mean, I actually literally had a minister or not a minister. It was a lay person in the congregation ask me um, after a church took a vote that I was at one night. Well, what do we do with the traditionalists that are members here? <laughs> But but so there's this belief that all reconciling churches think alike and that everybody who's a member of those churches thinks alike. And that's not it at all. It's that right. the church has been through a process. Everybody's been educated. Everybody can be in conversation. We don't all have to agree. Mm -hmm. um, but enough of the church. Um believes and values the things that are important to our men and the reconciling the movement mm -hmm. that that congregation voted that with their 75 percent um vote to to join right right i guess i would oh, just I add a little bit bishop if you don't mind about uh i i would hope that in the future all churches would be thrilled to receive a gay clergy person mm -hmm. i'm sad that they're not all ready to do so yeah and they're not and I know that bishops don't send places where gay clergy are going to be harmed because that right. is not good for the gay clergy person either. Right. Um, so my hope is that we continue, wherever we're starting from our point of journey right now, is that we continue looking forward and learning and educating and, and so on and so forth so that it becomes a less fearful thing. Right. So that they can point at the church down the road that does have an openly gay past and is having an amazing ministry mm -hmm and doing amazing work for christ in the world and they'll be starting to think well, well hang on a minute what are, what are we what are we losing out on right. by maintaining our position so i want to hope that um i'm you know i'm glad and grateful where that when bishops make appointments they they pay attention to the care of the clergy as well as the care of the church Absolutely. and that some churches sadly right now are not good places for openly gay clergy to serve and therefore they wouldn't be sent there because it would not be good for them either. Absolutely. Um, and so my prayer is that, that there'll be more and more churches will saying, mm -hmm. because honestly, there are so many young queer folks that are going into ministry who are going to be an extraordinary gift to the church, who are an extraordinary gift to the church. I agree. And, uh, and the churches would be jolly lucky to have them. Um, so that's my prayer is that we get to that place. Um, well, my, my niece is one of them. She's a amen. She's a exactly. So, um, yeah. and you know, and I will say that one of my seminary classmates, I think, is the most innately gifted pastor I've ever met, and she's a gay woman. So, once you see that, it's hard to deny that. Yeah, and um, you know, once again, I do think that we, as United Methodists, are people of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and when the spirit well that's why we ordain women right that's why the the conservative the far-right conservative churches do not ordain women because i think they've ignored the fruit of the spirit in the lives of ordained women or women because of bible verses and i think that um you know i i still marvel that uh paul went to bat for Gentiles with the Jerusalem church, that had to be awful. I think we get totally a sanitized version in the book of Acts, but they gave him a hearing, right? And how many times does it say in scripture? Oh, I love it. When Peter goes to Cornelius house, the Holy Spirit was here already. How could we not baptize them? Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit was here already. How could we not ordain women? The Holy Spirit is there already. Why are you denying the gifts of, of, you know, gay people all over? And the Holy Spirit is what distinguished Jesus. I still love it when Jesus, you know, John the Baptist followers go and say, uh, what can we tell John? And Jesus doesn't say, look at the Bible. Jesus says, no, go and tell him that the blind are seeing, the the deaf hear, the lame walk, the, you know, the captives have been freed. And um, I still, and I'll just leave with this thought on scripture. You know, I learned in seminary that most Jews did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah because the Bible says that cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. One Bible verse, one piece of scripture. You know, Jesus can heal all over. He can rise from the dead. He can do all this. But there's that one Bible verse. So they denied 
the divinity of Jesus. So I'm always amazed that when our founder, our leader, our Messiah, our Savior, a lot of his people missed him because of a Bible verse. Maybe we should be a little more careful about ignoring the spirit and going to the Bible. And I'll close with this. The Bible is supposed to be in United Methodism in the Methodist movement, a means of grace. And when it's not used as a means of grace, we should be on high alert. And so uh, you two are some of the most grace-filled people I've ever met. And I am proud and honored to have you as colleagues in, in, in the United Methodist Church and representing the United Methodist Church and uh, the blessing you will be to generations to come. So thank you both. Thank you, Bishop. Much appreciated. Yeah. It's good to be on this podcast with you. Thank you. It is. And I look forward to um, our continued to work together and um and deeper relationship for all people so thank you much and i appreciate this time so much and i will see you in months to come and look forward to it you will. so take care Thanks. okay bye-bye bye bye